thank you for your giving. Thank you uh, to the band. And uh, as I uh, as I was sitting there and I thought to myself, boy, we've had an awful lot of announcements this morning, but yet it feels incomplete. And it did feel incomplete because there's a pretty important announcement that I do need to share. And remember last week I talked to you about uh, the uh, our the church database and kind of going in and registering. Um, I got way, I, I was, you know, talking way above my pay grade. So what I thought I would do is have an expert put, give me an announcement, and I would just read it. So here we go. Pretend that this is just extemporaneous. Last week, we rolled out a new online directory. Many of you created an account and updated your information this week. Thank you. Now, if you have not done that, please do log in soon so that you can begin using all the functions that go along with the directory and the new event calendar. If you did not get an enrollment email and would like one, email Lori and she'll send you one. Good so far? Okay. Uh, you can at least, if you don't understand this, you can at least ask Lori. We'll make sure that, that uh, or that's available. Now, this week we're also happy to announce that our church website, the new one, is complete. And it's available at the old uh, site, www.lombardchurch.org. And if you would like to access the online directory, you can do so by uh, clicking on the Connect and Serve tab that is on the new website. If you have any questions, if you come to me, I can read to you that same announcement. Uh, but let me see a show of hands uh, of people here that feel fairly comfortable with it so that if you went to them and ask a question, they can help you. So who would that be? Ferrante, get your hand up. Uh, Ferrante, Kayla, um, Jimmy, I bet you, you would be able to answer, wouldn't you? Okay. You know there's more. Uh, yes, Elaine. You could ask Elaine. Uh, look, what we're trying to say here is almost anyone would be better than asking me. And it's not because I don't want to talk to you. But I'm just going to say, hey, Nick Ferrante is a guy to talk to. Andrew Massengale is a guy to talk to. All of these people, uh, they can help. But I have been on the new website, and it is uh, it, it is. A, uh, a marked improvement. So there is that. Well, Christian, what do you believe? Let's stand together and uh, share uh, a great statement of our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is a very short psalm, Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name forever. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Lord, we are grateful for your word and we're grateful for this instruction, this encouragement to give thanks. And not only we are the ones who should give thanks, but Lord, we have the privilege of inviting the world to know you and to be thankful. Father, make us, uh, make us up to that task. Encourage our hearts, Lord, not only to give thanks to you, but to lead someone else to do the same. 
Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. This week, we will celebrate as a nation the holiday of Thanksgiving. Now, Thanksgiving uh, is, uh, is somewhat of a celebration. It's a harvest celebration, uh, at, uh, again, at the end of harvest for many different nations. We particularly uh, have enshrined it, and we look back to Thanksgiving celebrations of the past as being remarkable. Uh, we look back to the Thanksgivings of the pilgrims in two particular years, 1621 and then again in 1623. In 1621, it had been a bountiful harvest. There was uh, every reason in the world for the pilgrims to gather and give thanks to God. In 1623, times had been more difficult. They were in famine. And the question came, maybe we shouldn't give thanksgiving, but maybe we should call a fast and a day of prayer and supplication asking for, uh, asking for God to change our circumstances. Fortunately, that idea was kind of beaten back. And in 1623, in a bad time, they celebrated thanksgiving just as they had in 1621 when times had been good. In our country, the particularly Christian understanding of Thanksgiving has never, ever been in doubt. Thanksgiving in, uh, in our nation was never really a secular holiday. It was always Christian. It was President Lincoln in 1863 who proclaimed Thanksgiving as the final Thursday in November. A portion of the original proclamation uh, reads as follows. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble penitence for our national perseverance and dis... Uh, oh, sorry, not perseverance, perverseness. You know, there's a world of difference between perseverance and perverseness. Not sure what I was doing there. So this is repentance. Repentance goes with perverseness. All right. Um... And I recommend, let me see, and I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, that they do also with humble penitence for our national perverseness and disobedience, commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged, and fervently implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. From that time until the present, our nation has never failed to observe Thanksgiving. The title of today's sermon, if you're looking at it and say, well, that just looks kind of weird, what's going on, uh, is uh, jubilate. It means to raise a shout of joy. It's to give a sudden joyful shout. It's to be overwhelmed with, uh, to be overwhelmed with a, a sense of thanksgiving such that, you know, when you're considering the, the goodness of God, you just kind of shout out amen. Jubilate, that's what's going on. As we look to our text this morning, uh, by the way, that's not Hebrew, that's Latin, so that's your language lesson for the day. As we look to our text this morning, I would ask you to remember that because it is a psalm, uh, this, is, this is a particular type of literature that is kind of all of one piece. Poems are kind of all of one piece. You can't pull parts out and just look at them entirely in isolation. We've gone through the book of 1 Thessalonians. 
First Thessalonians is a fantastic book, as is all of Paul's writings, to kind of pull out phrases and start looking in particular really in depth uh, because it's the way he writes. Poems and this psalm of praise kind of comes at us in a chunk, and we take it all in. Uh, we're going to work through the psalm, yes, but remember that the pieces don't work uh, just by themselves. They have to have all the rest of it there together, so we consider the entire psalm. Uh, what we see here at the beginning is a call to the nations. The psalm begins with, again, the Latin jubilate, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Now, we have to remember that before we received Psalm 100, uh, it was Israel's psalm. And what we have here is evangelism, in fact. It's an unabashed call that comes from Israel to the nations of the world to praise God because God is clearly worthy of praise. Now, this psalm was used, a lot of times they would use it as a liturgy for entrance into the temple. And as they were on their way up the, up the hillside to Jerusalem, they would sing this psalm. But in this psalm, it's almost as if the worship of Jerusalem, or the worship of God has spilled out of Jerusalem, and it goes running to the other nations of the world. Now, it's very true that Israel does not, did not know then all that we know of God. They were strong monotheists, which was really important for their day. Uh, it was remarkable from among the nations who all had many gods, because there were no non-religious nations, they or other nations had many gods, Israel had one. They were strong monotheists. The message of one God was brand new to their world. But they were not so timid as to think that the message of the one true God was true only for them. Rather, this message had been revealed to them for the benefit of the world. So the call to the worship, to the call to worship the Lord wasn't a general call to worship the deity of your choice. It was the call to all the nations to worship Abraham, Isaac, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it's not just a general, hey, wherever you are and whoever you worship, get to work and say thanks. It was, no, listen to our testimony of who God is. This is how he reveals himself and believe in this God. This is the God who revealed himself to Moses in the encounter with the burning bush as the I am. He is the one who is the ground of all being. He is the one who is always present. Maybe in other nations, they're looking for him, and he's just been misnamed and misunderstood everywhere. We'll help you know, as Paul was, uh, uh, as Paul later on, when he was at Mars Hill said, you have a, uh, you have an idol here to the unknown, unknown God who is kind of behind everything. Let me tell you about him. That's what Israel is doing here in this psalm. Well, as we gather today, we are monotheists. Absolutely we are. We believe in one God and that, and that that one God is the true God and that there is no one like him in all the universe. But... We've also been told some other things that the prophets begin to tell us and that Jesus begins and that Jesus comes and affirms to us that within that one God, there are three persons. Let me just ask you a question. Is that difficult to understand? If anyone shakes their head, no, you're lying. Of course it's hard to understand. I've just, I've just asked this question to myself and to anyone who will listen is it reasonable, reasonable to believe that a divine being who is the creator of all things should be so easily understood by his creation that we never have a question about him? I don't think so. One of the things that we are told about our God is that he is one, and there are three persons that make him up, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father has a Son. And from them both proceeds a spirit. And they're in perfect communion with one another, never a disagreement with one another. And they live a life of love. 
That's what the Bible says. And it's our very good fortune that their love has descended upon us. So when we go back to Psalm 100, we can say that Psalm 100 is our psalm because we have a God who can be worshipped with gladness. We can worship him with thankfulness of heart for he has made provision for our rescue and he has made provision for our eternal good health. So we sing of his goodness. We bring to him joyful songs because he is the author of every good thing. And because he is who he is, we urge him upon the nations of the world. For he's not only our hope, he is our only hope, and he is the only hope of the world. Nations, listen to us as we praise our God, and then join with us. In verse 3, there's a note of humility and remembrance. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Now, if at first glance, just reading through it, it's kind of reasonable to think, well, yeah, every, God has made everyone. He's created everyone. That's what that's speaking about. It's God the creator. But that's not what's going on in the psalm. They're not, he's not, the psalmist isn't talking about, let's remember God who has created us. He's talking about something more specifically or something more specific. And it's this. It's that Israel recognized that they were a special and peculiar people. That Israel had been made by God. It was God who made the great promises to Abraham. That from him would come a nation and that through him the world would be blessed. And so Israel, this is kind of, this is kind of odd, isn't it? Uh, Israel is calling out and saying, let's praise God because God has made us a peculiar people. You know, there are just some things that don't seem really appropriate to say, but they work because they're true. I'll never forget, um, and I, I've referenced it several times my, uh, about a year ago, um, almost a year ago this time when I had the chance to uh, make the trip to Thailand and Laos. And we were in the largest uh, evangelical church in Laos, and uh, man, they use they use their screens like nobody's business. Not, I mean, they've got they've got the words to the song, and yep, they do the Apostles' Creed every Sunday, and on and on. There was one particular there was one particular slide they used that I wouldn't use in our church on a dare, because it was culturally appropriate there and not here. They put up a sign that said. At this time, <laughs> we would invite all of the non-Christians to stand so that we can welcome you. Now, we're, that's not how we work, is it? Uh, no, we want to, you know. And you know what the amazing thing was? The non-Christians all stood, and they were smiling, and all the Christians clapped for them. We're happy to have you here. And after the service, what was really cool about it is I think that there were some who stood who would never be able to stand again to that slide because they did become Christians. So here we have every, this psalm saying, hey, we want everyone else, we want everyone in the world to thank God that Israel has been made a special creation of God. I'm not Jewish. I really haven't had one of those DNA things done, but I know i got a lot of German in me. And I've got some Welsh and a little Irish and who knows. And I'm being called upon to give praise that God has made Israel a special people. Yes. Yes. I am. Why? Because spiritually, Israel, they're my people too. 
It was God, you see, who made the great promises to Abraham that from him would come a nation and that through him the world would be blessed. And from Abraham to Isaac and Jacob, and then after 400 years of sojourning in Egypt, they were delivered into the desert, led by Moses, and at Mount Sinai they were constituted as a nation. And in the desert they were the sheep of his pasture, and he instructed them how to set up the courts of his tabernacle. Israel in the psalm is acknowledging that they were made for a purpose. And it's in that sense that this psalm says, we are his. Now, it's not immediately clear to Israel what all of God's purposes might be. But they know that they are God's idea. They know that they were formed... They were formed as a result of Abraham answering God's call and that, there are, and that God has reasons uh, behind that. So they say, this is a work of God, so everyone else in the world rejoice right along with us because just as you are being called to know and to worship the true God, you're being called to recognize that God has some purposes going on in history in the creation of this nation. Because they're a special creation of God, they're now not autonomous. They are uh, responsible to God. And they are an occasion in history of the grace of God. Were it not for his forming and protecting hand, this people would not exist. And so they announced this to the world. And again, they expect everyone else to be happy about it. By analogy, each of us are made for a purpose as well. Now, it sometimes may involve what we should do, but it always affects who we are. We're not made to be autonomous, living lives that just orbit around us. God is the center, and we're made for relationship with him. You see, not only is it a humble thing to acknowledge a God over us, it's just the truth. Again, it's just squaring ourselves with reality. Now, because of the time in which we live, and because we have not only an Old Testament, we have a New Testament, we know Israel's purpose. Israel was created especially for the salvation of the world. They were made to be a family nation that would serve as a vehicle through which God would reveal himself in, its, in his most perfect form, in his son, Jesus. We look back and we know that King David's greater son has appeared. And in his appearing, he has changed the world. So although Psalms speaks of God making us, and we say that, yeah, it's not about the creation of all peoples, it's about the formation of Israel, that's correct. But it's now also correct to take that a step further because since we know Israel's purpose, we say boldly, that Israel's purpose is actually the recreation of the entire world because it is through the son of the Hebrew nation who is also the son of God who makes us new. That's why, again, as I've said often, one of my favorite, actually the, one of the most profoundly true Christian children's choruses is Father Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them as a Christian, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. That's worth praising the Lord. That's what's going on in Psalm 100 when the writer says, we are his people. He has created us. It's not a mere accident that Jesus then reveals himself as the good shepherd and who identifies himself as the one who seeks the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But that flock has been expanded far beyond Israel's borders, and the invitation now runs throughout the whole world. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Every redeemed person has been twice made by God, and the second making or that recreation is the far more important. Of course, the entire psalm is a call to the worship of the Lord. 
But in verse 4, we hear the call to assemble as part of the worshiping community within the courts of the Lord. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Yes, of course, salvation comes to the individual. But the call goes out for the house of Israel. And in our context, all redeemed individuals around the world are part of a nation. We're part of the church universal, and we're called to continually being, being offered or continually offer praise to God. For Christ has redeemed us with his blood and has given us a seat in the kingdom of his Father. And so around the world, listen, I am, I am thrilled. I cannot tell you how grateful I am to have been born an American. What a privilege it is. We have freedoms that are wonderful. Uh, liberty is, uh, and just, the, and just the, the, the thinking that went into, and the divine providence that went into the formation of our nation, I am thrilled to death with that. But, you know, there are different levels of reality, aren't they? Right? I, look, you can, you can be having both a bad day and a good day at the same time, right? Uh, on, the day that, on the day that you get a raise, you can stub your toe. And if someone comes up to you immediately after you've stubbed your toe and you, they say, how's your day going? Well, you're a little conflicted, aren't you? Well, this happens to me very rarely whenever I'm preaching along and I'm going and all of a sudden I forget completely where I am. But there was a good point there and I hope I got it made before I stopped. Anyhow... Let me see if I can find my place and kind of re-knit that together. Mm -hmm. Anyhow. Yes, yes. Hey, can we edit that out of the Facebook uh, sermon there, Jimmy? I always knew, once they asked me, hey, can we put this on Facebook, I thought to myself, there's coming a day when it's not going to be good. Today's the day. As you read the psalm, there is a different and a really refreshing take on worship. I, I love this. Worship isn't a chore. You don't have to force yourself to smile, and it's not something to be endured. The reason the psalmist is so joyful is not because he has to be or he'll lose his job. You can no longer be the psalmist here because your psalms don't have any joy or hope in them. That's not where he's coming from. What has broken in on this man's soul is nothing more and nothing less than reality. I've been working that theme for the last couple of weeks, I think. Now, most of the time, whenever we're called to see reality, it's a call to be more serious and to have a more bleak viewpoint, isn't it? To a young couple who is living on love, we'll tell them, you can't live on love you got to get a job. There's some truth there, I suppose. To an, ex to an aspiring athlete, we'll say, you're not going to make the NBA, so lower your expectations. Be realistic. Uh, um, almost every time we talk about being realistic, it's a negative. Reality is usually hard and tough, and, and reality requires work and the quashing of dreams, but not this reality. This is real. God is good, and God loves you. So, uh, so acquaint yourself with a positive reality. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, and give thanks to him and praise his name forever. The Lord is good. His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues to all generations. The psalmist here has clearly seen the truth of God, He's realized within himself what it means to be loved by God. It's dawned upon him how great this God is, and if God is great, then it's the call and the privilege of his creation to pour forth praise to him. This is not religious observance. This is waking up to what is real and what is actual. So in our world, when we're real, we know the things to applaud and the things to to avoid. 
we run from bears. We're careful when we walk on the ice and we eat when we're hungry and you put on a coat when you're cold and when a God who is present, when a God is present who is worthy of praise of everything that is created, well, you praise him because it's what you should do. Because he is great, our response through this psalm is ordered in six imperatives. Shout, worship, come, enter, thank, and praise. Those are the occupations of human beings who know the truth. Shout his praise, worship him, come before him, enter his courts, and when you do so, enter with thanksgiving and praise. And you'll notice never anywhere in the psalm is time or place given to the circumstances of the individual. Not once. If we are redeemed, if we have become his child, and he has become our father, that's the circumstance. I want to say that again, no matter where you are. And you see, I say this in my life in kind of a 1621 Thanksgiving, right? Things have been really good. God has blessed me. And maybe some of you are going through a 1623 Thanksgiving where it's a little harder for you. I understand but if you are redeemed and if you have become a child of God and he has become your father, that's your circumstance. So give praise to God. We've been forgiven. We've been brought into fellowship. We have God's care in this life and in the next. We have an eternity in his presence. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. If you don't know that truth, then thanksgiving becomes a time of merely counting temporal blessings. And temporal blessings should be counted, by the way. But don't overlook the blessing that outstrips them all. The one that blows the others away. God is good, and his love endures forever. And for thousands of years, the people of earth who have come to know God have been singing his praises. So we want to close with a hymn this morning. For generations, people have been taking this hundredth psalm, uh, the, this instruction to praise, and in different nations, they've put it to music. They've expanded on it. Some just put the straight psalm to music. Others have taken it and worked with the phrases, and uh, uh, they've written some pretty great hymns. And whether it was used by worshipers in the first temple or the rebuilt temple or part of the liturgy of England's prayer book, the psalm has united believers in worship and praise. This morning as we close, we're going to sing a version of it. It's actually known in English slang as the Old Hundredth. Uh, it was written about 450 years ago. You'll find it on page 39 of your hymnal. So let's sing together, all people that on earth do dwell, shout for joy to the Lord. Let's stand together.
Thanksgiving season, jubilate, shout with joy to the Lord and invite others to know him and to shout along with you. Father, for this day, for this time together, for your word, for the encouragement that comes with being with our church family, we give you thanks and we give, we give you praise. Father, build within us, build within us this positive virtue of thanksgiving. Lord, it will be one of the main occupations of eternity, giving you thanks forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Go with God. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone.